good to be here this morning. Glad to see everybody. Um, we have good uh, social distancing this morning. Appreciate everyone who set that up so we could um, be together while being apart. So, uh, and Daryl, thanks for the uh, coffee and donuts this morning. I can't think of a better way to the old American Remembrance Meal in the assembly on the coffee and donuts. So it's good to uh, to be with you this morning. Normally, as we've been doing these assemblies, um, uh, we have our normal uh, worship time. We're going to do that again today. This is unique. Um, normally, the first Sunday of the month, we honor our graduates, um, guys who are completing six months here in our program. Um, so we're going to combine our worship um, with uh, that this morning, um, just like we normally do on Sunday nights when we do that first Sunday of the month. We always do it on Sunday night so that we don't interfere with our local church gatherings. But um, obviously our churches are gathering differently right now. So uh, we will combine the two. Um, and I was uh, want to also mention that next um, Sunday we will be honoring Easter. I know a bunch of comments made on Facebook about comments made that we won't celebrate Easter this year. That's not the case. We will be. Um, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, we will be having a sunrise service at about 6.15 Sunday morning up on our um, deck up there um, outside enjoying the sunrise and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Um, so um, look forward to you joining us. We'll be recording that too. So those who are watching our recording don't have to get 6.15 necessarily because um, it will be posted and you can see it at a different time. But we will be doing that next Sunday. Um, we have obviously had a ratcheting up of our um, concerns regarding the uh, coronavirus pandemic as it continues to sweep the world and continues to get closer and closer to home. Um, back even uh, a couple, I think yesterday, I saw on Facebook a friend of mine who teaches in Indonesia um, posted that a very, very dear friend of his um, passed away. Um, from the coronavirus in Indonesia um, this week. So, um, and our governor has put together a stay-at-home um, requirement, and so we're supposed to be um, quarantining a little bit more and paying a little more attention. So, um, we got, um, obviously, the seriousness continues. Um, I wanted us to, again, spend some time in prayer and quiet reflection over those who are impacted um, maybe you know individuals at this point, or you certainly know areas of our country and areas of the world who have been most um, most impacted, but the whole world has certainly not avoided it. Um, so I want us to have some time of prayer and reflection. Our medical workers, obviously, or um, our frontline support at this point, and uh, are doing a tremendous job. So um, I want to keep them in mind, too. So let's have a time of quiet prayer. And then um, I will close it out with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you as our sovereign God. We know, Father, that you are the creator of this world, that you are uh, in charge of this world, Father, that you are working at your purpose and plan throughout it. Father, it's incomprehensible for us to understand exactly what is happening, Father, but we trust that you are doing something and we see pictures, we see events, we see heroes rising up each and every day and people stepping in these spaces, these gaps, these hearts, and meeting those needs with your love, with your compassion and your grace. And Father, we see your hand in the midst of this pandemic. Father, I pray for healing of those who have been um, struck with this illness. Father, we pray for those who have already lost loved ones will bring comfort and support and encouragement to them. And Father, we pray for those um, yet infected, and we pray, Father, that you will keep us all safe. Help us, Father, to do our part, trusting your part, to uh, protect us and to uh, keep us safe. We thank you for those who put their lives on the line every day to um, serve those in need. And Father, we pray for their protection. We pray for their strengthening. And we pray for their encouragement. Father, I um, pray for this to come to an end quickly. And Father, I pray that what is accomplished through it, Father, will show your fingerprint um, in an eternal way throughout our globe. 
And Father, we just thank you for guiding us. We thank you for protecting us. We trust you and we celebrate your um, divine action in this world as we trust you through this time of uncertainty. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, this is Brian Cavanaugh. Brian is our 343rd His Way graduate since we started 14 years ago. You want to clap for that? <laughs> Brian and I are about the same age. Um, and uh, he's older. <laughs> and I appreciate, um, Brian, you uh, being here and graduating and excited about that. The one thing Brian's also done is all of us have appreciated is he gets up at 3 o'clock in the morning to uh, um, prepare us breakfast every morning. So uh, you've been doing that for a while, and I appreciate that. Um, so Brian, I mean, you, you're the one that picked this song. Um, so I'm interested in what, what you felt like that this meant to you and why you wanted to share it on your graduation today. Well, it uh, touches me in the sense that in my career, uh, I, I threw the party. I was the party. Uh, it was a nightclub business, and, and I threw parties in high school, and I was a partier, partier. Uh, and, you know, I, I didn't know what else to do and, until uh, I became a Christian. And uh, becoming a Christian, uh, I had to change my thought processes. Uh, and the party doesn't necessarily have to stop. It's just I had to stop. And in that, I uh, came here to his way uh, and, um, and, and broken. I'm, just, I'm still broken, brokener. And uh, I, I got baptized. And when I was throwing parties, my name was Barney. And I got that at a very young age. And it was a stage name, and it was fun, and it was a party. And, uh, and I was here. Uh, three years ago, approximately, and I was still Barney. I never got to Barney, and I left early, and I wasn't, uh, didn't, uh, didn't change, didn't, didn't happen. So I got baptized, and in that year, just last September, I got baptized, and we drowned Barney, and Barney is now dead. And uh, Brian is my name, and Brian is alive, and his new party. Is God's party, and uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah. Um, I know uh, one of the things you decided that you were uh, going to do is to graduate and stay a second six months, and we would call that our man's recovery group, and it's an opportunity to be here another six months and stay engaged in the program and get back to the program and serve in various ways. Um, some guys choose that, some guys don't. <coughs> Um, why? I mean, you've been in this recovery thing for a long time. I mean, this isn't your first rodeo. You've been involved in celebrate recovery, AA, a lot of different uh, modes of recovery. Why? Um, why stay a second six months? Why have you chosen to do that? Well, in my uh, adventures of uh, recovery and uh, giving back, uh, I did it all my way and my program. I try and reinvent the wheel recovery and I served, I drove vans, I drove for this church, I drove for that church, I worked this and worked that. It's all about me and, and, and what would people think and how I'm serving and wow, what a great guy and he's serving, you know, and getting involved in a transition house and it was all empty because it was me that was in that and coming here I realized the deep down that I had to find in me to work on continuing the rest of my life that um, keeps my connection, my sobriety with, uh, with Christ. That um, if I got it here and I felt in my heart the Holy Spirit moved me, that I need more training on how to drive that wheel, how to drive that car, and uh, helping other people in recovery. I know you have prepared some good things that you want to share with our guys. Maybe you can share that with us this morning. This is a poem that was written, and I want to share it to my brothers who I love. 
and it's called Today's the Day. Today's the day God has ordained for you. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. Today's a reminder that yesterday is gone, and tomorrow is today's the day. Where all wrongs can be made right. Today's the day to start again. Today's the day that you will win. No matter how many times you're lost in the past, God has a future for you that is bright and vast. It's time to look forward and go in the directions of your dreams. To do the impossible no matter how hard it seems. Today's the day to keep doing what you know to do. Draw close to God and he'll draw close to you. Disappointments, rejections, fear, and broken heart. God is going to use those real life things to give you a new start. Today, today's the day to believe you can, to do all things through Christ to empower you to fill his plan. Don't look at your left, don't look to your right. Today, walk by faith. Don't be distracted by sight. Today's the day for your dreams to come true. Say it and believe it. It's your Father's God's good pleasure to give his kingdom to you. And that's Keith Craig. Thank you, Ryan. So I have a message I want to share for a few minutes. Um, and after that, um, I'm going to open it up, too, again, for anybody who'd like to share it this morning. We're going to kind of keep it, keep it at your seats, and we'll just bring microphone around if you have some comments or maybe some personal things that... Um, relate to the message this morning. We want to learn from everybody. Um, the the thing that I want to talk about this morning is, you know, crises reveal character. Um, Christ. I don't. I don't think our character is formed in crisis. I think our character is revealed through crisis. We discover who we really are and who we really are. Sometimes we see good things. Sometimes not so good. Um, we see in our current crisis, neighbor helping neighbor, family time, closeness. We see people who are taking CPAP machines and converting them into ventilators. We see companies stopping their production of their normal products in order to make masks and to make respirators. We see food and prescription deliveries. We see um, the support of frontline workers in the medical community. We see government assistance and financial aid. Um, we see businesses willing to relieve mortgage payments and um, lease payments and rent payments and, and various billings. But we also see the not so good. I heard in New York they've had a 20% increase in domestic violence since um, this has begun. Um, we've seen our stores raided and people hoarding items for themselves. We've seen price gouging. We've seen politicians who desire to take advantage of the crisis because you can, as the, one of the great um, pol political proverbs is, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. And so the tendency, I think, to, um, to, take, to reveal one's character through this. Um, the challenge that I see in our culture right now that's particularly, I think, challenging is how do you fill empty space? You know, it's the great challenge of retirement. Most of us see retirement coming on the horizon, and so we make plans for it. The problem is, in many cases, retirement becomes a curse. Um, for some who have struggled with substance abuse, retirement becomes full-fledged addiction. Uh, because we are aware of what we're retiring from, but we have no idea what we're retiring to. And when all of a sudden you have a reason to get up in the morning, all of a sudden you have a reason not to go somewhere in the morning, when you don't have a reason to stay sober for any given period of time, you can find that retirement can, can become a disaster. And most of us in our culture right now have not prepared for an early temporary retirement or vacation. We have been put on hold with jobs, we've been put on hold with school, we've been put on hold with activities, we've been put on hold um, from going to the store, from going to our health clubs, from watching sports on television. 
And what do you fill that empty space with? Around here, one of the things we recognize is that empty places like that are dangerous places. Boredom, the lack of structure, accountability, um, court dates, work schedules, the stress of uncertainty, all are recipes for failure. They're all recipes for relapse. In fact, I just had a good friend of mine this past week who'd been doing well for well over a year. Overdose code and be brought back just because he was bored. Because he didn't know what to do for himself. And I think one of the things to keep in mind is that success requires a plan. And I think sometimes we think, well, I'll have time to plan. But what we discovered this last month is that we don't have time to plan. If you don't have a plan, you don't know when the crisis is going to hit and the plan is going to back. Right now, our local governments, our national governments, worldwide, we're trying to react to something that we didn't know how to be prepared for. And I'm not saying it's always easy on a plan, but what's important is that we have to have a mindset. We have to have a thought process. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, he says. Now, I really think sobriety is about preparing your minds for action. It's about having a plan. It's about having a mindset that's going to engage whatever and whenever something's going to come at me. And so it's important that we have the right mindset. Paul says in Romans 12 and verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That the whole foundation of recovery, which is not just unique to people who are in addiction programs, but is universally necessary. In order to not conform, I must be transformed. I must be converted. I must be radically changed and metamorphosized. And that happens with the renewal of my mind, with the renewal of my thoughts, with getting the right preparation set in motion in my life. It's about mindset. In Colossians 3, which is the text that I want to use this morning, in Colossians 3, in verse 1, Paul says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. If you've been converted, Brian talked this morning about the day that Barney died, and Brian was born. That day, that conversion, that transformation, he says in this text, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. Set your mind on those things. Seek those things. Think the above things, not the below things. And he goes on and talks about how. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 6, He makes that statement. But He tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he challenges us, Jesus does, with this idea that I need to set my treasure in eternal things. Where rust and moth can't attack, where thieves can't steal, where viruses can't get in. I need to prize those things because, he says, whatever you treasure will set your heart, will set your mind. And if your mind's not set, you won't know how to deal with it with the crisis. So the challenge is to set our mind on things above, to treasure those things. He goes on and says in Colossians, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And, and one of the things I think is critically important, he says here, 
is that the past has been resolved. You have died. Jesus talks about dying to yourself, taking up your cross, which wasn't in Jesus' day when He talked about taking up the cross. It was not a symbol of hope as an American Red Cross. It was a mode of torture and despair. So, He says, take up your cross, deny yourself, lose yourself, die to yourself. In fact, Paul will say in Romans 6 that when you're baptized in Christ, you die to yourself and you're born again. You're united with Christ in baptism. So die to yourself. Resolve the past. And establish the present. He says the present state. He says your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And so what's critically important to understand is now that my past has been resolved, my present state is I'm now hidden with Christ. As Paul will say in Galatians, I'm clothed in Christ. I find myself in Him, not in myself anymore. My current state is to be in Christ. And the beauty of that is God, as He looks upon us, as He gazes upon us, as He engages us, He then counts us in Christ, clothed, and counts us as a son. And then he goes on in verse 4, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. That the future, where our past is resolved, we've died, our present is assured that we're hidden in Christ, and our future is His glory. That's our future. That's what we look forward to. That's our ultimate end, is the glory of God in Christ. It's that truth that transforms my mind and ultimately radically changes my life. So see, the reality is this. We live what we believe. That's true. We live what we believe. Our mindset will determine our life expression. I mean, and one of the challenges is if you don't like what you're seeing in your life, transformation of your mind is your only hope. In fact, he goes on in this text to describe what happens, the life that happens because of this. He says in verse 5, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, God wrath is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. So he emphasizes that because our minds have been changed, because we have died, because we're in Him, because we have a future glory, we then put to death these things of the world. Sexual immorality and envy and lust and all those things are dying with that way of life. And we put on a new mindset, a new way of thinking that expressed itself in a new life. He says, But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self and practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its Creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So putting off is such a critical part of the transformation <laughs> process. However, if we put off without putting on, we'll quickly find ourselves in trouble. There's a passage in Luke chapter 11 where Jesus describes... This scenario. He says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none. It says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. 
Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. And one of the things that I want us to understand here is that if we put off without putting in something new, we'll end up with a worse scenario. That's his warning here, right? If we simply drive out the old, if we simply put off all these bad practices, but we don't put in a new lifestyle, we don't put in godly principles, we don't put in a new mindset, then eventually that old one will come back sevenfold. And I think most of us know that. We've seen it, we've experienced it. You go through a process of recovery. And you, you get rid of a lot of old habits, a lot of old relationships, a lot of old behaviors. But if you go back out there, how quickly it gets seven times worse than it never was the first time. How many of our friends have not gone out there just one more time, just one more try, and we end up at their funerals? Right? It's seven times worse. Jesus promises that. Jesus warns us of that. If we don't fill it up with something else, we can't just put it off. If we don't empty without filling. It reminds me of an illustration I've shared a few times. Um, if on your way to work, when you get to go back to work, but on your way to work, if it's your habit to swing by Krispy Kreme and get a half dozen jelly-filled donuts every morning for breakfast, you're going to notice after a while that your seatbelt's going to be a little tighter, the steering wheel's going to be a little too close, and your desk is going to be a little harder to get into. And you decide one day, I ain't going to die out. I'm going to cut out jelly-filled donuts as breakfast. The problem with that is if I just simply cut out jelly-filled donuts with no plan to replace it with anything, what do I do? I spend all my time thinking about what? Oh, jelly-filled donuts. Right. And I might drive by the Kreme, I might drive around a different way by Krispy Kreme a few times, but eventually I'll got to go the way I've always gone, and I'll notice whether the hot sign's on or not. I'll think about it. I'll notice maybe a friend or two that are at the Krispy Kreme as I drive by. And the next thing I'll come up with a reason to stop and go visit Joe at the Krispy Kreme and just say, hi, I'm not going to have a donut, but I just want to say hi to Joe. And then after a while, it's going to be, well, just one, what's one going to hurt? And pretty soon, it won't be a half dozen jelly-filled donuts in the car on the way to work. It'll be a dozen jelly-filled donuts. And the latter state will be worse than the first. Why do people go on diets and end up gaining more weight than they did before they went on the diet? you got to fill it with something else. For instance, if you give a jelly-filled donuts, my suggestion is don't think about jelly-filled donuts. Think about having a passion for fruit. And eat all the fruit you possibly can. And eat all the fruit as many times you can. And go to every fruit stand and collect fruit and be about fruit. And know when the freshest fruit is at the freshest places all the time. Become a part of being a fruit lover and consume your life with that so that donuts won't matter anymore. If you don't put something in, that's the key to putting something off. we got to stop the buffets and start the health clubs. You know, if we stop drinking and using without putting something else in, we end up being what most consider simply a dry drunk, right? We may not drink, but we have all the attitudes of drunk. We're still angry. We're still twisted in our perspective. We still have the emptiness inside. We just won't give in to drinking or using it. And to be honest, after a while, you become so miserable to live with, most people probably say, maybe you should drink. Because you didn't replace it with anything else. 
The key is found in this transformative mindset. This putting something else in that Paul has talked about here. He goes in, he goes on, by the way, to talk about our identity in this new self. He says that having put off all these things, we now put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, hearts, and kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all those things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You see, he talks, he begins with this putting on with mindset. As God's chosen ones, as God's holy ones, as God's beloved. See, that's identity. See, what we need to grasp is that I'm chosen, I'm holy, and I'm beloved of God. If I believe those things, and that becomes the identity of my character, then compassion becomes my response. Forgiveness becomes my expression. Serving and kindness becomes the natural outgrowth of one who sees themselves every morning as they look in the mirror, every night as they go to bed, and all throughout the day as I know I'm three things. I've been chosen by God. He selected me uniquely and specifically. I'm set apart by God. I'm holy and unique unto Him. That whether she likes me or not, whether he likes me or not, whether I get this job or that job, whether I get on the team or whether I'm first chair of this or whatever, I'm already set apart by God, the creator of the universe. And third, I'm beloved. I'm loved by God. If I believe those three things, then I'm going to be compassionate. I'm going to be forgiving. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to put on love which binds them all together. And it's interesting to me that the driving force of this he goes on to describe. He says at the very end of this passage, he talks about three key things. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. He talks about three key ideas. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let that define your relationships. Let that define who you are. Let that define your relationship with God. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart and express that peace with gratitude. Secondly, he says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach about it. Learn about it. Sing about it. Write about it. Talk about it. And let what? Gratitude be your driving force. And whatever you do, whether it's a word you speak or an action you take, let it all be done to honor God while gratitude drives your life. You see, if you really boil this all down, being a disciple of Jesus, being a Christian, is about recognizing that God has transformed me. And now my life is fundamentally driven by gratitude, by thankfulness. I got more than I can ever imagine. I'm chosen, holy, and beloved. My old has been killed. I'm clothed in Christ and I have glory for the future. Gratitude, thanksgiving becomes the driving force of my life. So you get rid of an old life with a new life. You get rid of old habits with new habits. You get rid of old playgrounds with new playgrounds. You get rid of old playmates with new friends. You get rid of old playthings with new passions, interests, and hobbies. Some of us have succeeded in this time of quarantine because we quickly put on 
our new identity. We've taken on spring cleaning, which by the way, the saving way will be glad to pick up anything that you've gotten rid of out of your homes and garages and everything else. We're still, according to the governor, able to go do that, so uh, call us up. Maybe it's yard projects you dedicate yourselves to. And if you need help, we got a bunch of guys that'd be more than glad to chip in, chip in and help you as long as they're six feet away. Maybe we're homeschoolers, house churches, family time. You know, don't tell me what you stopped. But tell me what you've started. <coughs> or the last day may become worse than the first. If any of you all want to have a comment or a thought, if you got something, if you want to raise your hand, uh, Nick's going to go around and bring the microphone to you. Um, let me say a prayer, um, and then uh, we'll share for a moment. Father, I thank you for the transformation that you have already made available to us in Christ. Help us to embrace it. Help us each and every one to prepare our minds for action. To allow you to transform our thoughts by getting rid of that old identity. By placing within us your new ideal. And continuing to well up within us the hope of your glory as we live gratefully for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to share something here that I've been carrying around for months. And it was the uh, essence of Christianity. Um, it's the spirit of Christianity is God loves me. What is the object of Christianity? And it goes along with what Tom's saying. I think the real essence of Christianity is God loves me so that I might make Him His ways, His glory, and His greatness known to all nations. Amen. I'll just read this uh, James chapter 1, 2 through 4, about endurance and, and facing trials. My brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. All right, well, um, I'm going to turn over our 344th graduate, Mr. Ronnie Humes, is going to share with us, right? This is probably one of the hardest things I do um, set up in front of y'all because of uh, my reading disability and all that. But I learned to live with that. I do my best and that's all I can, that's all I can do. Um, setting your mind on things above, not things of this earth. Pretty much what Tom was talking. Um, my mindset from my past is getting out of my own way. Um, in the past, I used to, I would sit back and, you know, the beginning of my relapse was I was always blaming my ex-wife for everything and why I did what I did and, you know, all the trouble I created in my life, all the pain I created. I would blame her time and time again. Um, even the two or three times I came in here before. Um, when Tom told me that I had to do six months somewhere else, it really, it, it hurt. Um, I didn't want to do it. But I knew if I came back here amongst the brothers that I knew the most, maybe this time I would get something out of it. I, uh, 
I opened my mind this time coming through here and realized my way of thinking, I would say it, it just was not going to work. So I stopped blaming her and stopped and started taking on responsibilities of my actions through all that. And it was, it was a relief because God came into my life and opened my heart and opened my eyes and realized my part in all this chaos I created. Um, it is, it has been a big, big relief that I have released this anger that I've held for a long time. Um, one of the things I have, one of the things I have fought is things I've fought more than anything is the damage that I've done to my daughter and my grandson. I went almost a year without talking to them and that was a very, that was very hard. But when I got here, I truly turned that over to God and I did not, I did not seek to talk to her. I did not seek to talk to my grandson. And when I finally surrendered to God, the both of them came back into my life. And that was, that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Um, today, we talk at least three times a week. And my life is just completely, completely turned around for the good. Um, one of the things that I have really, truly tried to get to understand was if God could give his son up for me, why can't I give my life to him? Because I know I couldn't do it. And I don't think there's a person in this room that would give up their child for anybody else in here. You know? But I just want to say thank you, Tom Mills, for everything you've done for me in my life. I don't know what I would do if you wasn't the hard butt you were. Because <laughs> you can, you people just don't realize you can be tough. Um, Daryl Floyd, without you, I don't think I could make it. You've always been my brother. And you kick me in my butt when I need it. And I know he's not here right now. He can probably hear us, Doug Stogner. When I had nobody, when I was at that mission, that man come and got me, week in, week out. I've known that man for 47 years. And he has not turned his back on me one time. That is my family. You all are my family. I've told Tom this before and I'll tell him again. You have to call the National Guard to get me out of here. I'm at home. This is my calling. I know it in my heart. God has given me a calling to help me. And I pray to God he gives me the same calling to help somebody else. I just say thank you and Hey, get it right, fellas. This is for real. This is really for real. We're hurting, we're not only hurting ourselves, we're hurting other people too. I'm tired of hurting people. And I know y'all are tired of it. I love y'all. Thank you.
want to obviously honor our guys who are graduating today before we uh, conclude. Um, and the first thing I want to mention is one guy who graduated last month, um, and also the two graduates this month, they're all staying um, the second six months in our advanced recovery group. Um, our lone ARG guy, uh, Mr. Cody um, Howe, is going to come and, and uh, present them with their bands and, and do the pledges with them. So come on up, Cody. So if I can have Josh and uh, Ronnie and Brian come on up and uh, we'll go over these with you all. In Matthew 20, 26, Jesus, speaking to his 12 disciples, says a very strange and unique thing. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you first must be your servant. As a member of His Way's Advanced Recovery Group, you will be expected to be a leader, but a leader who serves as Jesus did. I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as ransom for many. Matthew twenty twenty eight, In Matthew 24, 46, Christ then says, Blessed is the servant who the master can entrust, because of this servant will be entrusted with much. As if to further this statement, Jesus reiterates in the Gospel of Luke 12, 48, by stating, From everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask much more. As a member of ARG, you will be entrusted with much because you have been given much. Much opportunity, much love, much forgiveness, much mercy, much grace, and much of all the good things of life. Finally, in 1 Timothy 6.11, Paul, in instructing the young disciple Timothy, tells him, Pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, pursue faith, love, and perseverance in general. Brian Kavanaugh, do you, as a resident who is a member of His Way's Advanced Recovery Group, bow to be a leader? Yes. Do you, as a resident who is a member of Advanced Recovery Group, bow to be a servant first and foremost? Yes. Do you, as a resident who is a member of Advanced His Way's Advanced Recovery Group, bow to be a type of servant who can be trusted subsequently? who can be trusted and subsequently interested. Yes. And lastly, the U.S. resident who is a member of His Ways Advanced Recovery Group vowed to pursue righteousness, guidance, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and goodness. Yes. Based on the vow you have made before God, before your brothers, yourself, and your community, we would like to welcome you to the Advanced Recovery Group. Thank you. Thank you. Do you, as a resident who is a member of His Way's Advanced Recovery Group, bow to be a leader? Yes. Do you, as a resident who is a member of His Way's Advanced Recovery Group, bow to be a servant first and foremost? Yes. Do you, as a resident who is a member of His Way's Advanced Recovery Group, bow to be a type of servant who can be trusted and subsequently entrusted? Yes. And lastly, do you as a resident who is a member of His Way's Advanced Recovery Group about to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness? Yes. Based on the vow you have made before God, your brothers, yourself, and your community, we would like to welcome you to the Advanced Recovery Group. As a resident who is a member of His Way's Advanced Recovery Group, about to be a leader. Yes. Do you, as a resident who is a member of His Way's Advanced Recovery Group, about to be a servant first and foremost? Yes. Do you, as a resident who is a member of His Way's Advanced Recovery Group, about to be a type of servant who can be trusted and subsequently entrusted? Yes. And lastly, do you, as a resident who is a member of His Way's Advanced Recovery Group, Vow to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Yes. Based on the vow you have made before God, your brothers, yourself, and your community, we would like to welcome you to the event. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this time together. 
Father, thank you for giving us these men and touching their hearts in a way that they want to become leaders and help serve us and serve you, Father. I pray that you'll just watch over them and each and every man here and just lead and guide our steps, Father. Show us the right way, Lord. Forgive us where we fail you, and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Cody. You can be seated, Josh. You can be seated. Look at if you guys stay up here a minute. Um, I do have um, coins to give each of you. Come on up. Um, these coins are to be kept with you and kept in your pocket as a constant reminder of this day and the commitment you've made um, to God and to um, and to His people. Um, to remind you of the protection that we have in Christ as we continue the ongoing battle uh, for our faith and for our recovery. So, Brian, and Ronnie, and uh, let me give Mr. Kavanaugh his certificate. Says his way proudly presents this certificate of completion of Brian Kavanaugh. Entered soft found says began living his way dated March 20th, 2020. Congratulations. Thank you. His way proudly presents this certificate of completion. Ronnie Humes, the Intersoft found success began living his way dated April 1st, 2020. Congratulations. <laughs> Alright, as is our normal tradition, we always have a prayer led by our beloved founder, Mr. Clyde. Hey, 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 hey. hey. Hello there from your old conjure founder from 1405 Woodlot Avenue with all this wonderful technology bringing you uh, I'm not presence but at least six feet away. Uh, hey, uh, we want to celebrate this morning uh, Brian and Ronnie and Josh and their graduation. I wish I could be with you. Uh, um, this is a strange world right now. And I'm going to have a uh, prayer that I have uh, worked on quite a bit to uh, trim it down and to share with you that uh, I believe uh, represents what we all hope for and look forward to. And uh, join me in this prayer. Father, we come before you with hearts of concern for a world in chaos due to a virus that we have no knowledge or control of. But we believe that you control all things. The scriptures assure us that if we believe that you exist and earnestly seek you, our destiny is secure. Because of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of all who believe that he died on a cruel cross, was buried, and rose three days later. Furthermore, we are comforted that all who express faith in him by being born again in of water and spirit, enter in a, an eternal life where no condemnation exists, and therefore we know that our life is now hid with Christ in you. Also, we now can express this faith to one another through the avenue of love. So whatever happens in this chaotic world, 
we know you are working it for our good. Father, uh, today we celebrate the graduation of these three men, and we pray that they will resist the struggle that Satan brings to them and know that your love will overcome all.